give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Fight forever and ever and ever and ever. Hi, uh, today we're here with uh, the living legend Larry Zabisco. We want to thank him for uh, making the drive up I-85 and coming to our place in Charlotte. The first question that we always ask uh, an interviewee is uh, how you got started in this crazy business. How I got started, you know, that even amazes me today. It, it makes me believe in destiny because uh, I moved to Pittsburgh when I was about 10, 11 years old. First time I ever saw wrestling was uh, just like studio wrestling on Channel 11 with Bill Cardell. And of course, Bruno San Martino, he was like the god. He was the champion. And they had uh, Jumpin' Johnny DeFazio and Hurricane Hunt and all these cool local guys, Slip Mahoney, Dorso. And I sat down and watched professional wrestling at like 10 years old. And I knew that's what I was going to be, as stupid as that sounds. I remember going into like ninth grade and the guidance counselor, Hans Somebody, asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up so they could put you in the right school uh, gimmick. So, <laughs> I said, uh, well, I'm be a professional wrestler. And, like the guy, you know, like started laughing in my face and here I was, 130 pounds, full of zits, you know, skinny kid. Wanted to be a professional wrestler like Bruno. You know. mm -hmm. Anyway, everything I've done, I, when I wrestled in high school, I wrestled in college, I mean, everything I've done since I was 10, 11 years old has been geared to be a professional wrestler, and uh, so uh, I used my brain when I was young, kind of you know thought of the politics. And Bruno lived about one mile down the road from me. It was like it was meant to be, you know, like kismet. So me and my friend, you know, we turned 16. We can drive now, so we're driving around the neighborhood. And every time we went someplace, we go by Bruno's house to see if he was around. You know, one day we're driving by and. There's Bruno in the backyard. You could see him through the hedges by his pool. And uh, he was playing, th throwing a ball to David. And David was about, you know, I'm young, I'm four or five years old, young kid. So we drive around, and I stop, and I get the guts to, you know, walk through his hedges and introduce myself. It was just like, you know, destiny was pulling me into his yard. And, uh, you know, the brainless 16 year old I was, you know, we're all young and dumb. So, but anyway, off I went through the hedges, and I'm going through the hedges, and Bruno looks up, like, what the hell is this idiot coming through my hedges? You know, he stood up, and, and my God, I mean, you know, to see this guy in person when he was in his prime, you know, at like 5'11", 270, you know, 80 pounds, it just, just bones, I mean, big, it was like, it like made me believe that saying where a Darwinian man, although well-behaved, is merely a gorilla, well-shaved. Because Bruno was just a gorilla, and I was just so impressed with the guy, and you know, like like, a, like an awe of the guy, and uh, you know, became like my hero, my idol, and I just introduced myself and said, "Hey, I'm, uh, you know, Larry, and I'm uh, I want to be a professional wrestler." And he was looking at me like you know, I spent like 160 pounds by now, you know. And uh, I don't know, something clicked, and he kind of took me under his wing, and. Uh, Kind of kept his eye on me, and I started working out with him in his basement. And I actually did the same workout he did for years, which is why I kind of developed the same kind of look he had, even though I wasn't quite as heavy. I mean, his wrists were like 13 and a half inches. I mean, just big bone guy. And I introduced myself, and we uh, kind of it, it kind of clicked. And the next thing I knew, I was uh, I was his protege. And uh, the childhood and all that went just about, you know, about as, about as fast as the, the last 30 years did. So uh, that happened a long, long time ago, but that was it. It was just kind of a destiny, fate. I knew I wanted to be. I didn't care about anything else. I mean, going to college was the hardest thing for me because I didn't care. I didn't care about campus. I didn't care about being a doctor. I didn't care about being this. So, yeah, I just wanted to get the hell out of here in four years, but I wouldn't have to go to Vietnam and then hit the ring. And uh, it worked out cool, and, and, and that's the way it happened. It was sort of like a charmed, you know, I kind of believe people got like a thing anyway what they're going to be, but I just knew real young. So we always hear about Stu Hart's dungeon, but let's talk about Bruno's. Did he 
Did he have more than one guy there? Or? No, he never had anybody else there. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, right before me, a couple of years, he kind of helped out a little bit Johnny Valiant and kind of got him started. But uh, it wasn't the chemistry there. Like, you know, me and Brewer just had like a big brother, father figure kind of chemistry and for some reason. I was joining when they were in his basement. I mean, and talk about a workout. I mean, we would spend at least an hour and a half, at least, just working on chess. Just chess. You know, we'd be in his basement, and he didn't have much equipment. You know, in the old days, I mean, when we started wrestling, you know, in 1972 or three, whatever it was, I mean, the gym, there was no gym like every other, you know, every other strip mall, there's a Gold's Gym or a World's Gym with all this good equipment. I mean, you, you drove around cities, if you found a YMCA with a medicine ball and two dumbbells in the dust with a punching bag, you went, oh, workout room, you know. But uh, you know, Bruno's basement, he just had a bench and an incline and, a, and some dumbbells that went from like, you know, 40 pounds to like 130 pounds. He had these two 130 pounds. And the, the bench, you know, with a whole bunch of weights. And at that time, you know, when I was like you know, 17, 18, you know, working out, and when I got to like 20, 21, you know, Bruno was still doing like, you know, 505, I mean, you know, the free bar 505, boom. I worked my way up to 465 pounds. But we used to, you know, like start off and do some reps and then, you know, four reps of this and two reps of this and one rep of this, and then we do our heaviest rep. Well, I did 465. And then we'd uh, go, go, what the hell would he put on there? 315, he put on three pounds, like 315 pounds. And then we'd take that and see how many, we'd have a contest on how many we could do. I remember Bruno did like 22 reps with 315 after he did like 505. And I did like, I think 19, I mean, it was a couple of reps behind him mm -hmm. after I did 465. But uh, God, those were the strong old days. We spent a lot of time on that. And then he did those big pull-ups with the bar. Got that gorilla, you know, wrestling neck look. And then a bunch of heavy curls. You know, it was, uh, and then after that, then he'd want to go run, and I hated to run. And he'd run up and down the hills of Pittsburgh, you know, he'd, loving it. And I, I thought running was the most boring thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Give me a motorcycle. <laughs> Did he ever teach you anything about the, the actual wrestling at that point, or was it more just, just working out? <clears throat> Well, Bruno was, I mean, a very powerful man, you know, and he knew, uh, you know, a, a few wrestling moves. Bruno wasn't like a wrestler's wrestler, you know. He, he was a, just a strong, tough guy, but, you know, he knew some, you know, very basic, uh, you know, real good uh, hooks, and uh, all those guys did in those days, I mean, you know, something. I mean, they all knew something. They all going to hurt you in some way, you know. One guy would know a thousand of them, and one guy would only know two, but one of the two's going to get you, you know. Bruno would have front face locks, you know, wrist locks, I mean, stuff stuff like that. I mean, he was like a bear. I mean, you know, I remember, I remember one time him and uh, Dr. Bill Miller got in a fight in the Pittsburgh Civic Arena in the dressing room. You know, and Bill Miller, you know, always thought himself a great amateur, you know. And he was a big guy, Bill. I remember Bill and Bruno got in a fight, <laughs> and Bill comes flying over at him and makes the fatal mistake of, you know, putting his head down and coming in at him like a takedown, like he's in college. And then Bruno hooked his front face lock on Miller. I mean, now you're hooked by a, a grizzly bear. I mean, your head, you know. And I mean, I mean, Miller just tried to, you know, push his way, and Bruno fell back over a chair as he fell down, like Miller's neck just like bent. It's amazing this guy's body springs over him. <laughs> yeah, Bruno, I mean, you know, he you know, taught me, uh, m the most important thing he taught me was actually just by watching him, but the things he did, he knew the psychology of the people. He was one of these guys that, whether he knew it at the time or not, would walk out and the place would go nuts. I mean, when Bruno, you know, got hit and fell down, people had heart attacks. They didn't go booyé, they dropped dead. You know, I mean, f I remember one night in the Pacific Arena, you know, Bruno, uh, I think Professor Tanaka hit him with something. Bruno started bleeding, fell down. Four, four heart attacks. Four heart attacks in one shot. I mean, it was a, a different kind of thing. But Bruno knew how to feel this, and he knew what to do to keep it going. I mean, if you look at, you know, wrestling back then, some guys came and went, and most of the guys that stayed were the guys that owned the promotion. Mm -hmm. But Bruno, you know, just you know, kept himself, like, 
unbelievably over, you know, with the public for, you know, 20 years on top. You know, the Garden sold out every month for years. I mean, records. When I wrestled Bruno, the Garden wasn't big enough. We had to go to Shea Stadium. You know, in a time when it was unheard of, the wrestling was on at midnight. Mm -hmm. And no one 13 or under could go to the Garden. You know, I mean, uh, boy, if we had some video games in them days, baby. <laughs> yeah, someone would make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's uh, talk about your uh, collegiate background, because you went to Penn State, and you, you did wrestle in college. Yeah, Penn State, it was a, a short but successful uh, reign of terror. I was a uh, state champion in Pennsylvania in 1968 and 69, and went off to Penn State. And uh, yeah, I always had a bad attitude. I was not a good college kind of rah-rah guy. I mean, I didn't even like Joe Paterno. I mean, we were caring about the Nittany Lions. I, you know, I just didn't want to go to Vietnam. Right. And then going to college was like really crimping my my desire because I wanted to be a professional wrestler, I, you know. And at that time, as I was getting older and Bruno was really impressed with my amateur record, blah, 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 I was meeting some other guys. There was some guys from Wigan I was meeting and, uh, I mean, and, and all the guys would be nice to me because of the politics, because I was Bruno's protege and everybody was, you know, real nice to me. So I learned a lot of stuff that most guys wouldn't learn because the old school guys wouldn't teach them. They didn't want them to know because then that would cut their own throats. And uh, so, uh, you know, when I went to college for Penn State, I had a bad attitude. And I remember, uh, I remember one match I had in college, it was Penn State, and re one other reason I was really mad was when, when you were a freshman, you couldn't be on the varsity. You had to be on a junior varsity for one year, whether you were, you could beat the varsity guy or not. And I could beat the varsity guy, so I was pissed off. That, you know, I couldn't wrestle varsity, I'm over here. So here's our junior varsity team in the freshman year. It's like our second match at home or something. And our our team is losing. And now I, I wrestled 191, and then it was the heavyweight guy. And our team got beat so bad that even if I pinned the guy in the first period and ditto for the heavyweight, we still couldn't have won. So I was mad. So I go out there with this kid, and I was watching too much professional wrestling, you know, while I'm in college. So I go out there with this poor kid, and do some move and grab him and pick him up on my shoulder and put him down and the ref goes down and, and I let him up and I go, well, you just don't do that in amateur wrestling in college. So anyway, so the, the nice guy I am, I take him down, put him on his back and the referee goes down and I let him up again and I go like that. Now my team and the other team are both on their feet, you know, ready to go. Because our whole team is mad anyway that they got killed. And the other team's mad that I'm just embarrassed. I mean, I'm breaking every rule of amateur niceness, you know. And then they're all up in the coaches just screaming. My coach is cussing me out. <laughs> so anyway, what do I do? I take the kid down, you know. I mean, I pin him. But God, my dad's up in the stands screaming at me. Oh, God. So anyway, then somewhere along that first year, me and my buddy Joey, I said, I, I don't drink. I, I never really drank and I still don't drink. And uh, I remember the, the one and only time I ever got drunk was in college. And me and my buddy, I got this thing of cherry vodka, like a quart of cherry vodka. And I remember we drank that and I got so plastered on that. We wind up at some dance and Joey starts getting in a fight. And then I'm starting, all of a sudden I'm in this fight, and some guy grabs me and spins me around, so I pop him. Well, as, as he falls over, it's a guy in pajamas wearing some overcoat, and it's, it's the assistant dean. So <laughs> down he goes. So anyway, so I'm suspended for a year and a half. You know, so I, I actually, I really didn't wrestle all that much in college. I wrestled some, got frustrated, popped the dean. But then, then I went into the martial arts at that time and did a lot of uh, wrestling with... Uh, some guys uh, from Wigan, an old guy named John Foley, and uh, he was the guy who actually taught Carl Gotch. He was a small little crinkled up guy that would kill you. Mm -hmm. Interesting character. He was like a leprechaun. You remember your first match? Yeah. Yeah, I remember my first match. I was never so nervous in my life. I mean, as strong as I was, I could, I mean, walking up those three steps to the apron, was, uh, I mean, I, my legs had no strength. I mean, I was nervous as hell. In fact, I was so nervous, I probably just tortured this guy. I mean, I, know I, I mean, it was only like 18 seconds, but I know I must have just pounded the hell out of him. I mean, I, I, you know, I was you know, Bruno's protege, so I was going, and the people you know, bought me because it was that similarity, and 
the whole thing was perfect and the movement was the same. I mean, I actually move a lot like the guy. And, uh, you know, the arm grabs were the same and the boom. And, you know, it was just, it was, it was just perfect. So uh, uh, the people bought it. I remember how, how I was, it was, I mean, it, it took uh, not long, but the first thing, the one thing that really threw me off, now that I think about it, Weirdest feeling in my life. You always have those dreams where you're naked, running down a street somewhere, and you wake up going, oh my God, clothes. You know, feel like a moron. Well, I remember the first day, I didn't even think about it, because you work out, you want to look good, you're flexing, you're pumped. You know, and you're going to go out and, and into the ring, and people go nuts, but you don't even think about it until the first time you walk out, and everybody in the place is dressed, and they're all staring at you. And you've got no clothes on. you just got these stupid little tights, right? That's the first thing that hit me. The very first match when I walked out was, I got no damn clothes. I felt I felt naked, like you're one of them dreams, and that that only helped to dry my mouth and the nerves. I mean, I was shot, you know. But I think I would, if the match would have went five minutes, I probably would have collapsed. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, what, before you ever got into a, a big territory like the I guess the WWF back then. Did you toil around, and I guess the equivalent of what independents are today? Just kind of learning the trade? Yeah, basically, I, uh, there was a guy named, uh, see, there was kind of a weird name. There was a WWWF where uh, Vince McMahon Sr., mm -hmm. you know, basically, and a couple other characters like Phil Zacko, Willie Gilsenberg, I mean, classic, classic old time promoter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the Pittsburgh area was like a separate little territory at the time where Bruno owned it at one time and then. And this guy, uh, Newt Tatry, who was Guido, Guido the Mongol. Guido the Mongol bought it by the time that I was starting, you know. And, and Bruno would, you know, work at the Civic Arena and wrestle guys for him and stuff. So, uh, you know, so I basically started in a very small territory where they would run like Friday nights and Saturday nights. And then they do the, the TV live like at 6 o'clock. And as soon as that was over, you'd hop in your car and, you know, drive... Uh, 30, 40 miles to some high school. But it was the good old days. I mean, it was exciting, fun, and, and because I, I started in these little towns where I grew up as a kid, it was, uh, it was cool. It was kind of like being at home and, you know, I was, and breaking into it you know, the right way. And when I broke into it, because I was Bruno's protege, I was, I was broke into the business the best way, f you know, for me. I mean, they didn't, uh, you know, take me in and say, here, I'll put him on TV. And then you watch me, I trip over my finger, <laughs> oh my God, this idiot. This, you know, the first impression is the one people, you know, go by. I mean, you know, I, mean, I, I can tell you right now, you know, I can just sit there and watch some guy walk to the ring and tell you if you should get the hook and say, hey, get a job, kid, go home. Or if you should say, hey, this guy's got what it takes. I mean, I can just watch him walk to the ring and tell you that. And you know, some of these promotions waste waste months and years and, and money on guys that, you know, shouldn't even be in the business. But anyway, what was I talking about? <laughs> other than Bruno, did you have any other uh, big influences, people that really looked after you and helped you out? Um, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. Well, Bruno was basically the guy. Yeah. And because of Bruno, I mean, guys like, uh, you know, Guido, it was his pleasure to have me work out, you know, at his ranch. I remember me and Bill Eady, you know, we used to work out together in Guido's barn in the ring and ride the horses around. And, you know, he was a very nice guy, and uh, you know, but he let, you know he helped us out and let us work out there, and, you know, because basically, uh, you know, my friendship with Bruno and stuff. And, you know, Bruno, he was a big influence. I mean, you know, back then it wasn't like. It wasn't like today. I mean, there wasn't wrestling schools and guys says, hey, give me five grand and I'll uh, watch you jump around, you know. Uh, it was uh, that they, they didn't want you in the business. I mean, the guys in the business, they, they didn't want people in the business. I mean, you, you know, some guy come around and said, hey, uh, I want to be a wrestler. I'm a tough guy. They went, oh, yeah? And they put him in a ring with a guy like, you know, John Foley. And they look at him and say, this is a little guy. Next thing you know, his arm's broke. And, you know, off he goes, you never see him again. They, they didn't want you around. So just getting in, you know, was like hard enough. And then getting in like because the top guy says, oh, here, I got this guy. You know, it, was, it was big politics at the time. No, I guess it would be just like, uh, I don't know who it would be like now. You know, where, you know, there's, only one, there's only one thing going. But, 
You know, it would be like, you know, Ted Turner walking down and saying, hey, look, I got this guy, you know, the guy brought you in. So. Hmm. Well, let's talk about when Bruno brought you into uh, McMahon's territory for the first time. You know, that's a good question. I'm trying to think. I can't remember exactly. I can't remember exactly where it was. Wow, that's a long time ago. I think when I first started with the, the McMahons, I remember driving from Pittsburgh. This is like 1972, 73. So I'm going back to some brain cells. I have to go past some dead ones. I remember driving to uh, some little town in New Jersey. That's like the first time I think I... No, it was television. Might have been television. I mean, it was a long time ago. But back then they were doing television in a little Philadelphia arena and then like Hamburg or uh, some other town around there. Reading? No, not Reading. A long time ago. Might have been the TVs. I'm, I'm, I'm losing track here, isn't it? Well, by this time it was a full-time gig for you, right? This was... they did television and get some other jobs. Yeah, well, I, I never had a job. I mean, outside of, uh, you know, like some jobs going through, like, you know, the summer between school and sure. stuff, you know. Remember one summer I was a mover. That's when I decided right there never ever to have a job. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that was not a horrible job. I got cramming down the stairs with people's crap. Anyway. But yeah, that was it. That was basically the beginning. I did some wrestling around Pittsburgh, and that I went to to New York. And I, to tell you the truth, I can't remember exactly. It's been a long time ago. I might have started with some shows, but then there was a period where Bruno sent me off to British Columbia, and uh, I'm trying to think who was running it back then. Sandor Zabo and Gene Kaninsky. And they had a little thing around. Uh, British Columbia. What the heck was the name of that town? Oh my God. Vancouver. A long time ago, guys. And then the Brute was there, and Jerry Monte, and uh, got Donna Christianello, and uh, Tony Rose, and they had the midgets. And... So, anyway, it was a whole circus. Being an off I drive, I drive from Pittsburgh all the way across the country over to, to Vancouver. That was like an interesting six days. You know, I mean, you're just 21 and you can't wait to leave home. You get in your new car, bang, and you drive across the country. Mm -hmm. It was it was a cool experience. And uh, so I go to Vancouver for about six months. And uh, Bruno sent me there to get some experience. So then when he brought me, you know, into New York, he'll be as, as his protege. I would have polish, you know, and, and get rid of the nervousness and you know all that Mickey Mouse stuff. So uh, yeah, I went to Vancouver. I remember one time in Vancouver, I gotta tell you because it was so stupid. But this was like the you know, early 70s, and it was the time when Bigfoot was the rage. When there was a Sasquatch behind every tree from Seattle up to Canada, you know, back in those days. Sightings amok. So uh, one day, me and Jerry and the Brute, who was the Brute then, he was Bugsy McGraw then later. But, uh, you know, he was about 300 pounds. I tried to put him in your car, you know. Two other guys, and we're driving like off to Prince George or something through the Canadian Painted Mountain. We were real pretty up there, British Columbia. And uh, all of a sudden we come around this corner and there's a Bigfoot. I mean, this thing is 12 feet tall. It's like it's like this. It's full of hair. And, and I hit the brakes and I do this donut and almost go off a cliff because we're going to hit this damn Bigfoot. I mean, we all freak out. And then we stop and we look and behind this Bigfoot is this thing, you know, like blah, 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 souvenirs and stuffed animals. But... When you were coming around the mountain from one side, you couldn't see the store. All you saw was this gigantic, they, they had a Bigfoot and they covered it with bear fur and it looked like a damn Bigfoot. I almost got killed over that damn thing, never forget that. But then after that I came back and went to New York and it probably you know, was the time they would introduce me on TV in those days. And that would be at some town. It's kind of, that's kind of a blur back there. Do you remember any uh, impressions you have of Vince McMahon Sr.? Oh, Vince McMahon Sr., he was, I mean, God, you know, you, you mentioned these guys, and, and you can think back like the old days of the black and white movies, you know, back then, but you know, Vince McMahon Sr. was a, he was a real classic example of like a, a, a of a promoter of the day. I mean, the WWWF was the premier territory of the times. I mean, it was the big money territory. 
because all the because I mean you didn't have TVs all over, just didn't you know everything was the most populated you know territory, the biggest arenas, and uh, it also had what media in those days all the magazines, and all the magazines were were out of New York, so when you wrestled in New York, all the pictures were about you, so uh, you know uh, if you made it in New York, you know and, and got into New York, that was the place to go to get publicity and get a name. Then your publicity would go, you know, via magazines and talk, you know, and all the other promoters would want you. When you were done with New York, mm -hmm. you could pick up the phone and go anywhere, you know, go where the top guy was, you know. You know, it was uh, it was really nice. I mean, that was uh, that that was uh, God, that was a great era. Who were some of the, the top guys in the in the WWF at that time, other than Bruno? Well, when I, okay, when, when I first got in, you had uh, you know. Bruno, but then there was Chief J. Strongbow was uh, real hot at the time. I mean, uh, you were, you got in all these towns. I mean, uh, the people loved Strongbow, I and mean, he was a classic. I mean, he was a he was a sharp guy, and uh, you know could make crowds riot. I mean, uh, he was great. And uh, superstar Billy Graham was uh, coming in, uh, and you had classics that were already there for a while, like George Steele I and mean, Tanaka and Fuji. Uh, my dad's favorite was Baron Secluna, <laughs> but uh, let me think of some more. You know, it was me and Guerrilla were kind of teaming. Haystacks, Calhoun would be coming in. You know, around. Uh, I'm trying to think when Andre first arrived on the scene, but uh, me and Andre were real close. We used to travel a lot together. We used to go out to a little Japan a lot together. I can't remember exactly when he uh, arrived. You know, somewhere around that time, the Valiant Brothers were were really hot uh, you know, for a couple of years, and uh, they were they classics. But uh, trying to think of more guys. I mean, there was just so many guys, but they were in and out there. I mean, in those days, you know, you, you didn't go somewhere and say, "Well, here I am. I'm uh, just buying a house and I'll be here for 20 years." Right. You know, it was like you might be there six months, you might be there eight months, and Get all this publicity, and then you know, people would see it and buy their tickets. But then after eight months or so, you, you got out and you went somewhere else to wrestle because you got the publicity. In New York, you had to bring someone else in. Mm -hmm. you know, otherwise, the audiences would get bored quick. You know, and, then, and Vince McMahon Sr. to get back to him because he was a he was a classy character. I mean, he was a you know, a, a nice guy. I mean, in those days there wasn't a, a code like where if you got hurt, the promoter was going to pay your bills and. You kept getting a check, and you had a contract. I mean, it wasn't like that at all, you know. And uh, you know, this big man, senior, was always a guy that would say, "Well, you you need some money," and and uh, he was a classy guy. Always had like this long furry coat, and he always had quarters in his hand, you know. And he'd be jingling them. Soft-spoken guy. I mean, it was a yeah, it was a it was a actually you know, when you th when you think about what happened, he was actually the the, the perfect kind of promoter stereotype for that era in wrestling and of course when he went and his kid took over you know everything changed the, the television changed it went from you know the, the territories to cable you know to, to the nation and that and that changed the whole I and mean, that changed wrestling right there was, you know in terror you know with that nationwide cable came in it, it changed everything sure. and actually me and Bruno was really right about like the last classic confrontation of, of the era because right sure. after that, it was, it was like the, you know, the beginning of like the Hulk and the Ultimate Warrior and Zeus and you know a different array of characters. Before we get into talking about the, the classic feud between you and Bruno, do you have any memories of your tag teaming with uh, Tony Guerrilla? Because because you did that for quite a bit of time. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, Tony was uh, he was a nice guy, but we got along real good, and uh, he's he's a, he's a little older than I am, you know. So he, he was always like. Into like we gotta save your bloody money here. Stash it here in the bloody freezer. Don't buy that. Count the loaves and not bread. We get. Let's go across the street because gas is two cents cheaper here. Yeah, blah 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 blah. blah, blah drive you insane. I'm out walking around with the guy in the store. You know, he looks at a loaf of bread and he's got like a little computer. Do 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 do. I says, Tony, what are you doing? Well, I gotta see how many slices I have. So how much you know money penny per slice? So I don't. I can get one more sandwich out of this loaf. Okay, dude. <laughs> So, uh, you know, and, and I was a little younger, you know, I, I just couldn't wait to buy the Harley, boom, I'm going up and down the streets, you know, flying airplanes, and had a great old time. But it was, of course, sort of like the odd couple, because he was kind of neat, and I, I was more like uh, Oscar Madison, you know. Right. You come into his room, and come into my room, there's cans all over the place, you know. 
But you know, it, was, it was a fun time. It, it was a time when, when really I was, uh, you know, one of the advices of the old timers was always, don't get married, it's a great life for a single guy. Sure. And it was, it was a great life for a single guy. Mm -hmm. I should write it now. <laughs> Uh, let's, not everybody had the uh, luxury of growing up uh, seeing the, the feud between you and Bruno. Can, can you take us back there and, and let everybody know how it was set up and how it led to the, uh, the big match in Shea Stadium? <coughs> Destiny. Actually, it was, it was just at the point where, I'm trying to think I may I was probably 27 years old, 1980s or something. Something like that. And... Uh, I've been wrestling about six years or so, and Bruno's protege. And like anything else, you know, in, in, uh, you know, if you stay the same thing, you know, it gets old. I mean, you know, here I am, 27 years old, I'm kind of getting in my prime. I've had a great entry into the professional wrestling, and uh, you know, I've got a name at a certain level, but it's like, you know, if I I can't be Bruno's protege, you know, forever. I'm getting older. I, mean, I got to be me. I so it, it just kind of came to where the hands of time, you know, directed this this thing, and uh, and Bruno at that time basically was announcing, and uh, he was he was retired, and uh, the people you know loved him so much, but they accepted that you know he was retired, and it was this you know this, this situation where it was time for me to do something or get a job, and uh, you know it, it just dawned on me, I, I, you know. I, I said, I, uh, I have to stab Bruno in the back. I have to do something that shocks the wrestling world because if I do, uh, I'll have a name. It was, you know, it, it was, it was a destiny telling me this. I, mean, I had vision of it, and uh, the, the, the thing was right. And uh, and um, so uh, I'm trying. I'm trying. Trying to explain it here, so so you can get the emotion of the of the time because it was. It was so accepted that I was Bruno's protege that, that actually. The way I, you know, I guess you'd say built the thing up was you know I, I basically challenged Bruno to, a match. You know, I mean, there's a, a sincere. In fact, I have this interview at my house. I never thought I would see it. It was like one of the first long interviews with Vince McMahon Jr. You know, interviewed me because Bruno tried to, and I walked by him. And right away, people said, "What the hell's going on here?" It, but in, in their subliminal subconscious, they all want Bruno. They, they, they will buy any excuse for Bruno to put back on the tights. It's an era the fans did not want to lose yet. And uh, and I, I remember. Uh, finally, doing an interview where I challenged Bruno, and I, I did this so sincere. I should have. Oscars dangling, but I mean I did this so sincere that that everybody believed you know, with all their heart that there would be a scientific wrestling match between me and Bruno, mm -hmm. and there and even with that challenge and even with that match that Bruno finally agreed to, nobody would have bet, you know, I mean, no one would believe that I would have stabbed Bruno in the back. And it wasn't an easy decision to make. It was just a decision. What, what, after all these guys taught me this whole business, you know, I realized I had to stab Bruno in the back because if even if I stab like Gurria in the back, so what? It's Tony Gurria. If I stab Strongbow in the back, yeah, some people may be mad, but if I stab Bruno in the back, I'll be bigger than Benedict Arnold ever dreamed of. So anyway, I stabbed Bruno in the back, and uh, Bada Bing, we're gone. I mean, people were in shock. McMahon's were in shock. I mean, I, I remember Vince McMahon Sr., and not because he didn't know what he was doing, but because wrestling was always set in a way where you had Bruno or the Chief, but he had to wrestle. He couldn't wrestle just another wrestler. He had to wrestle Ivan the Giant or, uh, or you know, the Sheik with the fire. I mean... Or Billy Graham with the muscles. I mean, the idea of basically two wrestlers kind of like having, you know, a feud didn't make sense if I wasn't a 300 pound Japanese guy or a six foot nine, you know, I mean, that's, that's just the way the promotions thought. So uh, basically, uh, even, even the, you know, Vince McMahon Sr., he, he didn't think that it, it was going to be as near as big as it was. I mean, 
if you would ask at the time that you know we fired this uh, thing that oh, we're going to be selling out Shea Stadium because the garden's not big enough. I mean, record. I mean, he would say, no, I mean, you, you, you know. And that was one of the problems in my career that that what was not easy for me to overcome was the fact that you know I wasn't six foot nine and I didn't you know look like George Steele and and there wasn't like you know some outlandish gimmick you know thing that I would basically just come out with tights like Bruno. And uh, but, but the thing, w w I mean, it, just the whole thing between the fact that it was such a shock, and that you know, pat myself on the back. I, I did interviews that that were at the time not done. I mean, because basically every hated guy or heel or bad guy or whatever you call it, it was basically a gimmick. You'd scream or you'd you know eat a chicken raw or you'd smash your head through a you know a board or pick up a truck or, you know, something. But you would never do an intelligent, I mean, it's almost like the gentleman Jim Corbett, you know, it's kind of a very refined Muhammad Ali at the time, or Cassius Clay at the time. And uh, I, I was really, after shocking the crowd, plus they were so excited to have Bruno back. I mean, it was just a natural. But then, then there was even some politics involved in getting Shea Stadium off because like I said, the, even Vince McMahon Sr. didn't really think this was, you know, like a gigantic thing. And I remember uh, one time we had the match, because there's more to it than there's to it, the politics, because at that time, Bob Backlund was the champion. And uh, when Backlund would wrestle, no one cared, no one came. So the money for uh, the WWF was way down, and that's why Bruno kept coming back and, you know, agreed to come back, because he made a lot of money. But they had to pay him because, you know, Bob Backlund, you know, no one cared. Sure. So, nice guy, Bob, but just the charisma of a, of a lamp. So, um, you know, Bruno you know, kept coming back at the time, but, but that, that, that was a biggie. And I remember, uh, I remember I got death threats. I mean, I was warned, do not go into Little Italy in New York. I had three cars smashed. I was stabbed in the butt. With one of those damn, you know, those little knives that the you know, wooden thing, you you slide them together with a little piece of wood, and you know, buy two bucks at the Chinese restaurant or something. I remember some guy I was walking through a crowd, and all of a sudden I feel this thing like a Charlie horse, like someone kicked me right in the butt. I remember I turn around, and the cops grabbed this guy or something. I'm walking him you know, away, and when I turned around, I broke the blade off. I didn't know it. I get in the shower, I'm going, man, this guy kicked me in the ass. And I put my hand back here. I go, what the hell is that? Being can I pull out a blade about this long that broke off? You know, skinny little blades. Oh, was I hot? I mean, I was, I've been, oh, I've been overturned in cabs. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, there was a, there was a heat with that particular scenario. I mean, the me and Bruno, that I, I can't explain the generation of today will never understand how how much emotional energy, I mean, how much, you know, people truly hated me and truly loved and truly believed to the point where, you know, there's no music, no fireworks. I mean, you just walked out and the roof would blow out of the garden. I mean, and, and the energy would pass through your body in the building. I mean, the bolts and, and the rivets would shake because there was so much pure, warm, I mean, love and hate, you know, where today they'll run up and, you know, give you the bird if you, you know, jumped out. Well, back in those days, you jumped out, I mean, 200 people would kill themselves evacuating the area. There'd be bodies under chairs. Uh, people got heart attacks. I mean, it was a, it was a classy era, and, 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 and the, the feud between me and Bruno was the hottest emotional angle that there ever was in professional wrestling. I mean, uh, it was the end of the era, and it was the biggest heart attack causing, you know, car wrecking, driving people crazy, you know, best, you know, wrestling that, you know, situation that, uh, you know, ever was in that era, and, and, and will, will never be again, because uh, professional wrestling just doesn't look like, you know, at that anymore. It just not looked like at that. So, uh, that... That's a feeling I'm going to take to the grave someday. Too bad you guys will never know it. It was really cool. Well, it translates in anything. The, the numbers that it drew, uh, Chase Stadium, 40,000 people. I mean, it's, it's hard for people like us to 
realize the emotion of the time. Oh, yeah, the emotion. And, and for that time, because, I mean, uh, it just was unheard of. You know, I mean, I mean, even to the media, which, you know, professional wrestling was always like, you know, a stigmatism or something bad. I mean, they just, for some reason, wouldn't accept that people love professional wrestling. What's your problem? What do you care? You know? I mean, report about it. People would go out of the way not to talk about professional wrestling back in those days. And, uh, you know, to do this was unheard of. I mean, me and Bruno, we kind of woke up a lot of people. And at that time, Madison Square Garden cable was uh, going. I mean, I think back then in the early 80s, I was people were watching me in, like, Saudi Arabia wrestle. I had no idea. But uh, it was just the right timing where people, you know, sat up and said, hey, man, professional wrestling just sold out Shea Stadium. I mean, the Garden and the Forum aren't big enough for professional wrestling, and then, you know, Massacre Garden Cable, I mean, that, that, that had these people say, we've got to put wrestling on cable, I mean, you know, wrestling has been on TV since the beginning of TV, I mean, it's been on cable. I'm amazed it's not on network yet. I mean, you know, I don't know what NBC, CBS, ABC, or whoever else would see is thinking, because thinking if you don't put, disappear. yeah, well, it, you know, it, it I think it was almost gone a few years ago. I mean, I think Network, you know, should have bit, should still bite, missed the boat. But uh, wrestling made one mistake. It got too vulgar. You know, it got, uh, it got, uh, it just got too raunchy and vulgar. The wrestling went away, and all of a sudden, there's vulgarity and all kind of sexual innuendos. And you know, I mean, instead of watching luchadors fly through the air and bodies clashing, you're watching some, you know, plastic boob blonde bimbo laying in bed, and she's mad that the guy can't do nothing. It's like, what, the click? You know, now try watching that with your kid, you know. You click, you know, and these guys are going, you know, all clicking us off. We would have pushed the same guys, you know, click. But um, anyway, very interesting. Just going back to the Bruno, what was, what was Bruno's first uh, impression when he had the idea of, of hearing his, uh, his student versus him? Did he, did he like it right away? Or? Uh, no, I mean, I don't think... If I remember right, I mean, it was I don't think there was like this big comeback, like he was dancing through the street. I, I mean, I think he thought about it, but um, and, I, and knowing me, I probably you know kept hounding McMahon and stuff and tried to get it pushed through. And, and I think the one I think the one thing that really helped it at the last minute because wrestling is such a weird business. If I remember right, Ox Baker came in because at that time I wanted to wrestle Backlund for the belt. And again, you know, with the promotion, I mean, I mean the Bruno thing was so hot. But, but anyway, I wanted to wrestle Backlund for the belt. I had a hard time getting that past Vince too. And uh, I remember Ox Baker came in and they had some plans for Ox Baker. I mean, the guy, you know, big guy, looked horrible. You know, didn't do a bad interview, you know, for that kind of character, but, but it was horrible. Once the bell rang, you know, Ox was horrible. And he was so horrible that, that Vince McMahon Sr. watched his match turned around and went, get the hook, oh my God. And, and, and he really didn't say it all that much. He gave guys a chance, you know. And, uh, uh, but I mean, he was so bad. That <laughs> Vince okay. And that left like next month's garden thing wide open. So he had no choice. I think I ran right in there again. I mean, you know, so I, I mean, you know, but Bruno finally went for it. And, but you know, I mean, he was, but again, you know, he taught me stuff just watching how he worked because Whenever someone's got ideas, no matter how good they are, no matter you know how great they sound, you know you, you just don't go okay, because what are you going to do next month? I mean, you I mean, you got you know the business is we're actually running the business and making money in this business outside from a few guys. It's, it's basically a lost start, and uh, we can go into that maybe later. But uh, you know it uh, it was a uh, it was destiny. Where did we pick up the, the, the nickname The Living Legend for the first time? Well, right after my feud with Bruno. I mean, I, as I was you know, doing the feud with Bruno, again, all the publicity in the magazines and all that were in New York. So, I mean, all the publicity, every magazine was me and Bruno, me and Bruno. And then, and then uh, but Bruno was working, you know, the bigger shows. He wrestled the Garden, the Civic Arena, the Boston Garden. But then I, I'd be going all week long. I'd be wrestling, you know, Maria here and Ivan Putsky there and Pedro Morales here and my God tried to escape from twenty thousand Puerto Ricans. Jeez, oh, they didn't want to turn me over in the cab, but I could get stabbed too. But anyway, 
But uh, what was I talking about? I keep thinking you guys got me thinking of more stories. All these stories probably I haven't thought about for 20 years. No, whatever comes out is fine. We, we talked about where you picked up the living legend. Oh, the living legend. That's a long time ago. Anyway, the magazine, I don't know if it was Bill Apter or Napolitano's or who was right at the time, but because Bruno at that time when he retired, but then he came back to wrestle me, you know, he was Bruno the living legend. And he was, a, he was like the, he was the living legend. And then when we did our thing, right after Shea Stadium, I mean, you know, Bruno retired. Well, so I capitalized on that immediately by taking full credit for retiring the man. You know, I, mean, I couldn't shoot my mouth off long enough. And the more I said I retired Bruno, the more people stabbed me and wrecked my cars, you know. But the money was rolling in, and, you know, and all the promoters would say, God, Zabisco's a pain in the butt, but he, he, he draws, damn it. God, he gets heat, damn it, you know. He's not, he's not six foot five, damn it. He's not my son, but, you know. So, um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, the, the more I took credit for retiring Bruno, you know, the hotter I got at that time, you know, for everything I, I did. And I remember it was, it was one of the magazines that, you know, you know, Zabisco retires Bruno, so he claims, you know, now the new living legend. So I, it just came out in all the magazines, you know, to help their stories and stuff. So I read the magazines, and I'm the new living legend. So I went, what, that would really piss people off. You can see right now, I'm 28 years old. I still had a whole bunch of hair. It was long and wavy, which was like the style in those days. And, uh, you know, I'd be strutting around with, with a tan going, hey, I retired Bruno. And everybody, I mean, they still love Bruno. And that generation of fan, they still wanted to hang on to that tremendous amount of emotional, you know, satisfaction and, 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 and release, you know, that wrestling gave him his fans. And uh, so the, I mean, the more I claim to be the new living legend, the more money I made, the more cars they wrecked, I got beat up. Some old guy hit me in the head with a cane. I mean, oh, it was ridiculous. But I mean, it was, it was the wild days. It, it was great. But I mean, to be hated, I mean, actually, I mean, I used to have to sneak out. I used to have to tell the promoters, I says, look, I'm going on third. And then before intermission, and then I'm running out the door. And I, my car is parked way in the back because I, I, I couldn't walk out. I, mean, I, I couldn't walk out into the people. I would, I would get, I would get stoned. I, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> you, you couldn't do it. It was suicide. And uh, I remember uh, I used to, you know, a couple of times I'd rush out like you know, wrestling third. And after a couple of matches, and they, they'd realize I'm rushing out. Right after my match, boom, maybe outside. I mean, I'm laying down in the back seat. I got my girlfriend, you know, driving away. I'm going, go, go, go. And I hear people yelling. Boom, I hear rocks hitting my car. And all of a sudden, she stops. I'm going, what are you doing? It's a red light. Go, you idiot. Boom, rocks are flying. And I'd go to Boston Gardens, and I'd land, and I'd get in the cab. And a little old guy's driving me to the Boston Gardens. It's like a 10-minute drive. And we, we, we pull between the two buildings and go to Boston Garden. There's, there's hundreds of fans there, man. And, and all of a sudden, I said, I, I, I get up and I'm locking the doors. <laughs> I'm up the window. And he's looking. He says, You okay? And I says, Yeah, just make sure your door's locked. And it's just, sure enough, and as soon as we go through this building and then they see us, it's a bisco! Boom! Rocks are flying. I mean, you know, bottles you know, crashing, beer bottles crashing against the windshield cracks. This guy, this little old guy driving panics, and he tries to pull around to go up this ramp up the back into the back of the garden. Well, he misses the ramp, and now his, his cab is like, like sideways like this because two wheels are on the ramp and two are below it. And I'm like this for the people, of course, sweet, sweet fans that they were at the time. They went over and pushed the thing over. Now we're upside down. This old guy's laying upside down. I grab his heart screaming. Oh, God. I mean, yeah, that was a heat. So the more I said it, so the living legend, yeah, and then I just used that for really like, my, my, like 10 years or so. You know, people just hated my guts, and and uh, it was easy to do with my ability to talk and do the interviews to throw in their cockiness. And and because Bruno was a living legend guy, I mean, it would be like saying, "Hey, I retired," you know, Muhammad Ali, you know, uh, or whoever. But it would be like the man of that era. You got him. Mm -hmm. So the more I bragged, you know, and then but then it then it stuck. Now a generation goes by, and now I'm on WCW. And I'm doing a lot of broadcasting, a little wrestling, and Nitro got big. I mean, I was like, you know, one time I was doing all their shows. And then, uh, you know, I was like everywhere, but they were always saying, 
because the broadcasters were a little younger, like Shivani and them and some other guys. And then I just became the living legend. I mean, the wrestlers walk by, they either call me sir or they call me legend. Hey, legend! And it, was, it just became like a nickname that stuck after all them years of using it, you know, to, to really uh, get people thinking. So, uh, and now that I'm, you know, almost 50, you know, I, I guess uh, it all kind of fits. So like, now that they've been knowing, knowing me, you know, as this for so many years, now I, now I looked apart. <laughs> Help us fill in a, a gap here where uh, you went from the WWF and we know you uh, did some work for uh, Vern Gagne and you also did some work out in Georgia. Leaving the WWF, where did you go next? Was well, I tell you, that was, uh, was about seven, eight years I went straight and then you know, it, it ended with, with the, the whole Bruno thing and wrestling some other guys, Putsky. Tell you a funny story about Putsky. Way. Yeah. I just tell you a quick. Well, then remind me about your question. <laughs> okay. Because I remember that this one time because we, we had this one riot and I'm wrestling Putsky in Albany, New York. I just give you a typical night of mine. This is like this happened like you know seven nights a week. But, you know, here's a typical you know relaxing night. So I'm, re I'm wrestling Putsky and then the place is you know crammed with people and in Albany all the things was an armory. It was classic wrestling atmosphere. You know the cigarette smoke, the light over the ring and. You know, the two guy boom, the crowd just wanting blood. And I remember Pusky's in the ring, and there was one guy in the front row that for some reason hated Pusky. Everybody hated my guts, but this one guy hated Pusky. And through the match, I'd, I'd hear him yelling, Hey, Pusky, you stink. You know, we'd wrestle, and i hear, Hey, Pusky, your wife's ugly. You know, hey, Pusky, this. Hey, Pusky, that. And Pusky could care less what this guy is saying. And we're wrestling, and all of a sudden this guy says, Hey, Putsky, you're short. Bang! Putsky runs out of the ring, grabs the guy, and starts peppering him, right? <laughs> so I see this as a golden opportunity. Now that the people have gone absolutely berserk, the match cannot get higher than this. You know, if I, if I kept wrestling Putsky, this was the ultimate pop. So I jumped out of the ring, grabbed something, hit Putsky from behind. Well, here comes the riot, you know, bang. So all these people come out, there's like six or seven Albany police that surround me, you know, but there's people all over. It's not roped off like nowadays with these big silver things. There's nothing. So, uh, so I'm going back with the cops and all of a sudden, boom, I feel the shot in the face. Some guy punches me, you know, to, to the cops encircling me. So I get mad. So I, I, I turn around and I grab him by the hair and I go to hit him. But he goes to duck, but he just goes right on his knees like I still got him. So bam, I kick him in the face, and out he goes. Well, now these idiot cops, there's like six or seven of them that were surrounding me, they all leave me, and they grab this guy I just knocked out. And there's like six guys dragging him out, hitting them with clubs, and I'm all left alone, right? So I, go to, so I start going berserk, because that's the only way to scare a group. So I turn around, and all of a sudden, bam, on the head I get this thing, and I look over, and some 80-year-old guy hit me with a metal crutch. And now because he hit me, he's losing his balance, and the crowd is now, like, pushing him over and trampling all over. I couldn't hit the old guy. So they, they trample him, so I run out. I got a thing on my head like a baseball from this guy. And then we drove to the next town and did it again. But anyway, you asked me the question about... After you rolled off from the WWE. Ah, what did I do? Okay, so anyway, after that, I was uh, I was just kind of tanked. Eh? I mean, kind of burnout. Not really burnout, but I just wanted to take a break. So it was about a year I really didn't wrestle. I might have went to Japan for like, you know, three or four weeks. But there was no independent. I basically like uh, uh, found this beautiful chick and we... Uh, you know, kind of lived together, she had a good job, I had some bread, so I just kind of like, just had to take some time off. I mean, I couldn't, it was just, you had no, you had no normal life. I mean, you had a, a great, exciting life as a professional wrestler, driving around the road for years, and night after night was, you know, one, uh, you know, wild time. You'd sleep all day, you'd get out to go to the arena, you know, boom, people going nuts, get a bunch of money. You come back to the hotel and you'd party if you wanted, or you know, I used to go to bed like up the golf the next day. That was heaven to me, and, and uh, it, was, it was just great. But it, but it wasn't normal, you know. So after a while, you think, well, it'd be cool to have a home, <laughs> you know, have a chick that really loves you, and, you know, and enough already, and um, you know. So, so so you try that. So I basically kind of gave that a try. It didn't work long, but. Was no, this was out in New Jersey. New Jersey. 
Yeah. Yeah, I was living on Parsippany, New Jersey at the time. Anyway, it worked out great for me. We, we never did wind up getting married, and she was an insane Italian. So I think she might do that out of jail. <sighs> so I threw out two names there, uh, Vern Gagne and, uh, and then Georgia Championship Wrestling. Well, that was some territories. I mean, that was the, the at that time now it became the WWF. And uh, you know, Vince McMahon uh, Jr. You know, was now running it. And he, he was giving wrestling a, a, a different twist from what wrestling was with the other promoters. Because the other promoters were still like Vern Gagne and the Crockett. I think Ole Anderson was involved with Georgia. But they worked with like Dusty and the Grams from Florida and the Crockett's and this. And maybe Fritz or somebody in Texas where, you know, they'd work more with, with each other where Vince was kind of more like the, 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 the lone territory. You know, but again, still the guys would go to New York, you know, get the publicity and then filter back out. But Vince was into, you know, like, it, this was like the era of the giant guy. It was Andre and Hogan's and Zeus's and I think uh, with the big boss man back then, you know, big guy. And, you know, he wanted like the, the big guys, boom. And, uh, you know, so me and the other guys that were more of the, the wrestler kind of guys, you know, we found homes with guys like Vern Gagne and the Crockett's because they liked a little more of the... You know, older school, even though it was an old school then. But they wanted, they basically wanted to do more of what they did and not what Vince was doing. Vince at this time would, like for the first time ever, would have like two guys that were wrestling each other in some videos, singing songs and dancing around. Which, you know, I mean, was like surprisingly like off the wall, so you had to watch it. But, you know, it was never done and, and wouldn't even be thought of by guys like Vergania and the Crockett's and these other guys. So, uh, you know, so I, I came down and wrestled in for the Crockett's a little bit, and I came down and wrestled for Oli a little bit and did some things. Yeah, I would just go in areas and, and basically work with the top guys at the time and give them a good opponent, like Tommy Rich or Mr. Wrestling 2 would be in Georgia. And they've already wrestled Abdullah and whoever, whatever. So Larry Zabisco would come in, and I had my like, feud with Tommy Rich or Mr. Wrestling 2, where we had uh, Killer Brooks by the bell from Orndorff and... You know, it was just different characters. You know, I'd do some stuff in the Carolinas with Dusty because he's already wrestled everybody. So then you, you know, and then after a while, then Vern Gagne, who had, you know, uh, actually the AWA, even, even the years where the WWWF was like, you know, the, the premier territory, the AWA was a real hard territory to get into. It was a real nice place to work. Vern was one of the really better payoff guys in those days, and, and you'd make a, a lot of money through the winter months, but in the summer months, he wouldn't run that much. Maybe do some TVs, you'd make a couple of bucks, but you'd have a lot of time off and a lot of time to be at home. And it was a kind of life like a wrestler, you know, you'd love, let me go work for Vern for a couple of years so I could be home all summer, this would be great. I mean, it was a real nice place you know, to make money and work. You wouldn't make as much money as you would in New York, but in New York, you're you know, you're gone six, seven days a week. You know, I mean, it was it was all year round. It was a tough lifestyle as you got older. You know, not not tough physically, but just tough mentally because you know you wake up. What what motel is this? What city am I in? Yeah, you know, it just uh, it just got to be just a constant blend of the same. You know, driving motel, driving motel, and then it was the flying. Waiting in line, flying, waiting in line, flying, motel, motel, what motel am I in, you know, you wouldn't know what the hell city you're in after a while, and you wouldn't care, you know. What, one feud you remember, and when we, uh, we talked about a few people about you coming here over the weekend, they, they all remember the, the Killer Brooks angle. You want to give us kind of the same scenario you did with Bruno and you know, uh, recreate that? God, God, I'm a smart guy. You know, I, I never really got involved in a whole bunch. I mean, I was never like, you know, I guess like, you know, a Hulk Hogan superstar kind of guy. And, and I really didn't do a whole bunch, you know, like Flair with the rest of everybody for 20 years. But everything I did, if I came in, they were pretty much classics. Kurt Henning with the roll of dimes people talked about. And the Bruno thing was like the biggest of that thing. And even, you know, the latest stuff with uh, Eric Bischoff and Scott Hall. You know, I mean, I pumped that up. And, you know, that was all I did, brother. I was the architect. And it was, you know, when I wrestled them, that was the two highest buy rates WCW ever did. And that could be a coincidence, I don't think so. But uh, the Killer Brooks thing, I mean, it was a classic of what I remember at the time, because 
that was a, a, a time uh, when working for George, I mean, it, w it was okay, but it really wasn't like a hot in my mouth. I mean, I did okay because I was on the top. But if you weren't like me or Tommy Rich or Orndorff or a couple other guys at the time, you know, it was so-so. Uh, but again, it was an easy life because you were home a lot. But uh, Killer Brooks was an interesting character. I mean, the guy was known in this business as normal. Killer Brooks was a little more out there than than most guys. I mean, we, we got along okay, but uh, he could be a, he could be a, a, a trip to be with. I mean, he'd be in some restaurant, and some guy would look at him wrong. And next thing you know, you know, Tim's gone. He's over there pulling out the guy's hair. He's got a headlock pulling out his hair. Hair is flying, and the guy ah, horrified as he's got his hair yanked out over dinner. So <laughs> these guys are insane. But uh, anyway. Uh, just a thing at the time where I wanted to get my hands on this belt and of course because actually I did an interview and it was such a great interview at the time that I even got the Crockett's mad at me who should have been jumping up and down for joy because realizing how much heat I generate with these interviews so of course me being you know, from New York I'd come down here to Atlanta Georgia or whatever and I'd right away in those days I'd still give the shot you know, to the south so I come back from Stone Mountain one time and they got Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis and someone else all carved on the side of this mountain, you know, like a big monument to all the Confederate heroes. So I come in and I do this interview, <laughs> I do this interview about, uh, about uh, Paul Orndorff and, and uh, Tommy Rich and these guys and I'm going to do this and that and get these belts. And I says, you know, I went to Stone Mountain and saw the... Uh, these guys, Jefferson Davis, and I said, blah, blah, blah. I said, when I'm done with you, you guys are going to be up there like the rest of the all-time great American losers. And that just pissed off the clock. I mean, they were mad. They wanted to fire me. You know, Dusty and the was going around, no, that was good. You know, they had a fire on it. pissed off the south. So anyway, it was kind of some politics, you know, again over there because I couldn't keep my big mouth shut. But, uh, but finally, kill, we interjected Killer Brooks because... Just something different. I mean, you know, if the fans, you know, see the same old pull the leg, click. So it was just something different where, of course, I would, you know, help with the uh, shafting of Orndorff with Killer Brooks, who, if you looked at Killer Brooks, you'd never be a guy like Orndorff, so that was great right there. But then I would just cockily come along and buy the belt. So now here's this cocky New York blowhard, you know, walking around the South, knocking, you know, with, and it was just a perfect, you know, one of the things that stick in the mind of people. You know, it, it's uh, there's a psychology, and if you do it right, it'll, you know, uh, it will be great because it will make everybody excited and they'll, and they'll love it. And if you don't do the psychology, you know, it ain't going to work. You know, and, that, and that's the difference between like the rise of WCW and its disappearance. It's too bad. There's not too many people left that know. You mentioned that you uh, did a lot of the uh, traveling with Andre. Mm. You want to talk about... Uh, oh, know? yeah. Andre was great to travel with him. I'll tell you a couple of funny stories. I mean, a couple of stories, you get the idea how it was. <clears throat> but, you know, we get off the plane, we land somewhere. <coughs> I'm talking too long. I always like to walk behind Andre because I like to watch the people. You know, Andre would walk through the airport. And there'd be hundreds of people coming at you as you go the other way. And everybody would look straight forward like everything's normal. But as soon as they passed, as soon as Andre passed them, their heads would turn. And walking behind Andre, you would see this. I mean, hundreds of people walking like nothing's happening. As soon as Andre would pass, they'd all turn. And you'd have, you know, 50 people at a time, you know, blocking the lines, all turning their heads watching Andre. Walked through the airport and, he, and I mean he was big. He was you know bigger than this kid, the giant. Now I mean he was bigger and and he had this afro at the time. I mean and his you know, head was big enough, but then when he fluffed out his hair, I mean it looked like a tent. I mean his hair looked like a parachute. I mean the size was unbelievable. And you know it was just the most outrageous sight. Then we get in a car, and I think me and Gurria are in one car, and Freddie, this little kid Freddie came along, he's got a bigger old road car at the time, and he'd pick up Andre. Freddie liked to drive Andre around, he was a little referee guy. And we didn't really want Andre in our car, because Andre would break your car. Just sitting in your car, and your car, you would break it. So, 
of Andre was in the car, and me and Tony were driving, we were following him, and Freddie's driving. Andre's like in the back, you know, and there was no front seat or something to Andre to do this thing. And uh, we got up to a stop sign, and Freddie goes out a little bit too far or something. Some guy comes down the hill, and had, they have a little fender bender, because Freddie rolled through the stop sign. Boom. Well, Freddie gets out like a little skinny, pimply faced kid, and, and this guy sees Freddie's. So he gets out of his car and he's mad that Freddie, you know, rolled well, through the stop sign. So he's cussing Freddie out. And he's walking up and he's going, You stupid son of a gun! You idiot! He's rolling up his sleeves like you're going to get the beating of your life. Well, as he's getting close, the door opens and you see like this gigantic parachute kind of head appear that's as big as the top of the car. And all of a sudden, the head gets out and Andre emerges and he's towering over the car. And this guy is now seeing Andre, and he goes, Oh, my God! And he starts rolling up his sleeves, and he walks back to his car, and he shuts the door, and he locks it. And he sits there with his arms folded. Because in those days, nobody had cell phones. So, I mean, just calling up the cops didn't work. You had to, like, wait until some idiot drove by or something. So, I saw that. And this is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I mean, now this guy's going to go back and say, hey, this moron pulled out in front of me. And I was going to slap the hell out of him. But then this guy, 12 feet tall, you know, tall stood up, so I didn't do nothing. Like, yeah, right. You know, I mean, it was, a, it, was a, it was a classic, but that stuff happened all the time. I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, the only one time we're walking across the street uh, in, in, in L.A., me and Andre, in, in California, you can't do stuff like that against the light. They get mad and give you a ticket or something. So we're walking across the street, and there's this car, and we hear this cop's voice, please return to the curb, sir. <laughs> and I just, Andre just looks at this cop car and keeps walking, and I'm looking at the cops, because, I mean, they couldn't have fit him in, in their car if they wanted to. And the cops just look at each other and go, don't <laughs> even bother. Just let it, let it go. They probably thought it was a, big, a Bigfoot in them day shade. You know, that's what it looked like. But then, he was a classic guy. We had a lot of fun. Let's go into your uh, EWA days. Uh, and, and any, maybe any Ghana stories that you have. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if you were in the past or you still are. You were a son-in-law to Vern Ghana? Yeah, yeah. I took off with his oldest daughter and he hated me for years. That was uh, fun at the time, trying to keep uh, that courtship secret. Oh, so it was a secret courtship. Okay. Well, at the time, yeah. I mean, at the time. I, 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 mean, I didn't want anybody to know, and uh, it, it, it's just kind of weird because it was it, this business, there used to be a brotherhood, and it, it's not like it used to be anymore, but in them days, and uh, Kathy was such a sweet kid, and we had a great time, and, but it was like, no matter how you know, cool you were together, it was like, hey, Zabisco's going out with the, this guy, and so it's either right away, I'm after the money, you're trying to weasel my way in the office, and blah, 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 blah. You know, and uh, and it was also a thing where you wouldn't want your daughter going out with a wrestler kind of guy, and I, I you know, so it's like, you know, we knew Vern and him found out, you know, it, it would be like, my God, you're going out with a wrestler? What's wrong with you? My God, you were raising this. You should know better. It's a wrestler. You know, he's no good. So uh, it was a you know, combination of things, and it didn't, you know, it didn't last forever. Everybody got a good six, seven months out of it. And, I think one time we went to a Bob Seger concert, uh, and all of a sudden we turn around and there's, you know, Greg and some other people sitting two rows behind us. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take care of that. Okay. Oh God! And then Vern, you know, and Kathy would say, "Oh, let's go, over, you know, let's go over, kind of like we'll see mom and dad." You know, I remember one time we're going out this boat. It was sort of like a meeting, and Vern's, you know, Greg just sitting there and they're hating me. I was kind of sitting there trying not to smoke a cigarette. You know. And Vern, you know, is making me wear, well, I had sunglasses on, but he's making me wear like this big hat. And he had a big hat because as you drove around this lake, there's lots of people hanging around the lake, and he doesn't want anybody to see us. You know, it's business. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, no outsiders. No one should know Larry Zabisco was on the same boat with Vern Gagne because Vern Gagne was a nice guy, and I was a, a bad guy, supposedly, and they still shouldn't be seen together, even though I, I can't wrestle this guy. He's, then, you know, 60 years old. Anyway. He still thought like that, so he'd be we'd be like in the skies cruising down the you know Lake Minnetonka there somewhere, and 
all of a sudden you hear some guy from the shore, Hi, Vern! How you doing? And you just hear for God damn! Oh, God damn! I mean, just freak out. It was, it was it's ridiculous. You had to be there. Appreciate. Appreciate how much that really crushed Vern. Some guy, some spud had recognized him from up there. Uh, There's a point where you ended up winning the AWA title. Yeah, yeah, actually, you know, I was, um, if I remember right, we were talking, I was I was down here in the Carolinas for a while doing some stuff, and then uh, I was talking to Vern and them, and uh, Lawler, I think Jerry Lawler at the time had Vern's belt, and I never wrestled Lawler, and Vern, you know, our deal was, well, come on up and we'll, we'll, we'll wrestle, you know, uh, months of things, we didn't have a big feud with Lawler for the belt, and it would have been a, 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 I mean, you know, me and Jerry could have put on a hell of a, a matches, I mean, you know, it would have been good. And uh, so I said, yeah, that sounds good, you know, good with me. So anyway, when I went up there, then I don't know what happened. If Lawler thought, uh, see, again, it's the politics, you know, Lawler might have thought, well, he's the kid's uh, son-in-law, so now he wants to give him the belt, bing, and uh, he, he took off to New York. I think that's when, well, I don't know if he took off to New York, but when I was coming up there to do something with Lawler, Lawler left and went uh, either to New York or Memphis or you know whatever, but uh, for some reason he took off. I still don't know why. You know it's too bad. We could have had a hell of a classic thing. So then you know I just didn't. I think wound up with the Bachwinkle was there and the Saido. Yeah, Bachwinkle did some classic stuff. You know everybody was expecting me to get the belt at a different time then, but that's when I had uh, the world's greatest advice for Kurt Hennig. See, you know, we we caught him off guard. Mm -hmm. Brought up the uh, the angle with Kurt Angle. You want to recreate that one as well because that was another one. That I think you were on ESPN at the time. So a lot yeah, of people ESPN. Right. Uh, it, it was hot when it was on ESPN. It was out, it was out of the Showboat Hotel in Vegas, and uh, every three weeks we'd go there and you know film some shows. And I used to love it. Every every three weeks it's a paid vacation in Vegas. I mean it was it was great. It was a it was a great time, and and and, and the crowds were. Uh, were hot there in Vegas, and actually, there wasn't a lot of chanting. But the ESPN show, when, when I used to go out there, we had this announcer Larry Nelson, and Larry Nelson, and uh, you used to egg it on. There was a few people that would sit at ringside that used to hate my guts, and they would chant, "Larry sucks." And pretty soon after, because we went back there all the time, and the show was pretty popular, and they showed it twice a day or something on ESPN, or twice a week. And uh, and Larry Nelson used to egg it on, but the, they started wearing Larry Suck hats on the, on the ringside. And then pretty soon it caught on where the Larry Suck chant, you know, everywhere I went, as soon as I walked out, Larry sucked, Larry sucks, thousands of people chanting that in unison. But, and, uh, but it was before, it was like one of the first, I mean, before that, people never chanted stuff. People wouldn't even say suck on TV or in an arena. I mean, it was a different time of man. So I'm taking credit for the chant, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And then later on, they just dropped the, uh, the sucks part. But um, yeah, so at that time, yeah, but uh, they were expecting me to get the belt and uh, we were a little sidestep there. But uh, uh, Bachwinkle and Henning had a heck of a match. I think it was in San Francisco and I was at ringside with the tuxedo on, looking good. And uh, people accused Kurt of using a roll of dimes. They've never got it on camera. But, uh, you know, I claim, of course, I gave Henning the world's greatest advice, and he just having a clock box wiggle to right time. And the match went like 45 minutes or something, getting close to the time limit. So box wiggle might have been tired anyway. But uh, people talk about that one for years. So whenever people think something's going to happen, it just can't happen. You know, this does, it's no fun. Okay, go ahead. Okay, let's, let's go into the time when you had a run with uh, Baby Dollars, your valet, back in the, the Crockett days. Well, it's an interesting little story of politics there. Baby Doll uh, you know, did some valeting before with Tully Blanchard, I guess, and some other guys, and didn't did a good job at it. Baby Doll's a... Uh, Nice kid, did a good job. Uh, it was a weird time of her life, though, because it uh, must have been the biological clock. She was looking for a man and for some reason wound up with Sam Houston. Sam Houston, very jealous guy. 
I remember there was a situation going on where me and Baby Don were about to blackmail Dusty Rose, and we had an envelope with some very uh, telltale pictures of of Mr. Rhodes, but there was a coming to a point where Baby Doll was, was going to give Dusty a, a big kiss, the kiss of death, and the promoters thought this was going to be a great symbolic gesture on the part of Baby Doll. It really put a lot of suspense in the, uh, in the situation, but Sam Houston was so jealous, went berserk, and wouldn't let Baby Doll give Dusty Rhodes the big juicy kiss of death. Hence, Baby Doll was never seen again. <laughs> Can you explain to us why uh, Sam Houston got such a big push back then? When? Did he get a big push? Yeah, he got a pretty big push for a while. What group? Uh, well, he, he I remember him in the WWF dancing around to cowboy music. No, before that he was, uh, he was saving Dusty in the ring some. Dusty would come save him in the ring. Well, you know, Sam Houston, I mean, <laughs> he wasn't a, a bad... Uh, I don't know what you call talent. It's not that he didn't have ability. He just didn't have a fearsome look. He wasn't a very, you know, he wasn't a small guy, but he wasn't like a muscular, developed guy. And the professional wrestlers, I mean, there has to be something respectable, something fearsome, something when the normal man looks at you and or sees what you look like or how big you are or, or you putting a guy in a bunch of deadly holes where, where the average guy says, I wouldn't mess with that guy. You know, there's a mystique there. There's, there's something that that tells Mr. and Mrs. Every Day, like this guy's not normal. And, and Sam Houston just wasn't a threatening guy. He just wasn't someone that you could look at and say, you know, I mean, if he got mad at me, I'd run away. It just, uh, it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Charisma in professional wrestling. Some guys are the toughest guys that walked on two feet. But if you turn on a camera, can't say nothing, can't project it, can't be themselves. And there's other guys, you know, who, who couldn't beat the way out of a paper bag that that people look on as, as like supermen. And it, it's a fine line between, you know, what you promote, what you can get out of it, etc. And Sam Houston, you know, was okay, but he just had such a young look, a, a young intimidating <laughs> kind of look. You know, he couldn't hurt a fly, but, you know, and he couldn't. You know, it was just like Sam Houston's going berserk. Who cares? You're telling us that you uh, you had never wrestled Jerry Lawler. No, I never wrestled Jerry. But but you were the promoters were talking about it. You're telling us a story off camera. Well, the, I thought we mentioned that earlier with the AWA days. I mean, the only thing I I met Jerry a couple times way back working for Jim Barnett in the old Georgia days when you know Turner was a little station in some trailer UHF somewhere. Very, very short time, and he was a funny guy, very talented guy with, you know, the art, and a uh, witty guy when you listen to him, but uh, never uh, never wrestled at all. Between me and him, we would have had a, a, a uh, <laughs> we, we would have had a, I don't know what the, what the right word is, just a, a dynamic, you know, build up, just in interviews alone with the way he could talk and I could talk, you know, and uh, it, it would be something you just had to see, but the only time I was going to wrestle him was back in the AWA days when I first went in there for Vern, Lawler had a belt and they were talking about me versus Lawler and I really don't know what happened between Lawler and Vern because Lawler took off when I was going in and uh, I don't know if that's the time Stan Hansen wound up with the belt for a while or Bockwinkle probably had it 50,000 times so I really don't know. Nick used to sleep with it. His wife had it in pressure on her stomach. <laughs> We're on a couple of names and throwing them around. Everybody has a... a the name game? game? The name game with... Uh, how about with Dusty Rhodes? What about him? It's the first thing that comes to oh, mind. Dusty. Well, Dusty is, you know, he's a, he's a unique character. Anybody that survives, you know, time in wrestling has, has something on the ball and something, you know, they were smart enough to do that people like him enough or hate him enough and, and they got, you know, staying power. And, and Dusty is, is a very clever guy. He's a very smart guy. He's a very witty guy. He's one of the best interviewers you know, the business knew. I mean, Dusty could grab a mic and, and you know, talk into dropping money in a hat if he passed it around. You know, he was a, he was a, a good talker. Never blessed with a great body. But then if Dusty Rhodes had a great body, he wouldn't be Dusty Rhodes. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing, you know, in his prime, you know, for being a, a big guy, you know, you know that 
really wasn't a super solid guy, but Dusty could move. I mean, he could move that weight, and uh, he could uh, he, he could uh, be very energetic, and uh, he's a true classic. You know, it's just you know, just the same as like Ric Flair and some other guys. I mean, Flair. If you see one Ric Flair match, you've basically seen them all. Every ten minutes, he goes over a turnbuckle. But uh, there's just something you know that that he's done and figured out where he could do that thing over and over for twenty years, and people never really get uh, get tired of seeing it. I could go out there and stall for fifty years, never get hurt, and wouldn't get tired of seeing it. Someone who's a broadcast partner of yours and coming back to your AWA days, Bobby Heenan. The Brain. Oh, the Brain's a classic. He's a uh, like, like one of wrestling's true comedians. Bobby could have his own television show where he would need no guest, no sidekick, nothing. Just have Bobby sit there, turn the camera on, and just let him talk. You know, we used to, like, you know, force Bobby to ride with us, not charge him any trans, just to get him in the back seat so we could drive and just listen to him do stories and impersonations. And, and uh, oh, he's just a natural crack up. And, uh, and again, he, he's one of these guys, sharp guy when it comes to, you know, psychology. I mean, he was one of the, the best managers in terms of, you know, steering up a crowd. And, and then you see Bobby, you'll fly in and go bouncing around. I mean, the guy, the guy was a classic. I'm a big fan of Bobby Heenan's. And, uh, you know, never ran out of stuff to say at the, you know, broadcasting you know, for years and years. Because, you know, after, you know, 20 years of broadcasting, you, you, you kind of run out of stuff to say after a while. But, uh Bob, Bobby's one of these guys that's just one gag after another. I mean, I can't repeat some of them, but it's just one constant gag after another. He's one of the guys you definitely want to invite to a party. I mean, he used to come up with things, and uh, we, we'd fly to Japan. And it's like a 14-hour flight, you know, from New York to Tokyo or whatever. And as soon as they start serving dinner, because we all know as soon as everybody eats, everybody has to get up like sheep and go to the bathroom at the same time. So while everybody's eating, Bobby Heenan would get up, and he'd go back to this big 747, which had like, you know, 10 different lavatories, and he'd take his little pocket knife and he'd slide all the locks over, and they would, they would all say occupied, except one. He'd leave like one unlocked. So he'd have it down to a science. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so after dinner, there'd be about 200 Japanese all lined up, because they were doing this flying coach, They'd be all lined up from the back of the laboratories all the way to first class, just waiting in line, dying. And the Japanese are too polite to say anything anyway. Because all of this, they all say occupy, even though no one's in there, and there's one that's working that takes forever. As you can imagine all these people dying, and we'd be up there laughing at them. And at the same time, he would be putting x slacks or some kind of stuff in Calhoun's beer or soda or whatever. Because uh, halfway through the flight, you know, Calhoun had to go. And the reason that he did this to Calhoun was because Haystacks, Calhoun weighed 600 pounds. And Haystacks could not fit into a laboratory. I mean, you know, if it was occupied or not occupied, Calhoun could not get his body in a laboratory in the back of a plane. So you can imagine how the stewardesses had to, like, slide curtains while you would hear these ridiculous sounds flying out of his ass and the entire back of the plane dying of stench as he would then straddle a blanket or something that had to be long enough to pull through his cheeks to wipe his butt. Just some of the little things that happens when you travel around with gigantic people. Switching such. What about uh, Greg Gagne? Greg Gagne, good old Greg. You know, Greg, uh, boy, it, it, it's tough when uh, you know you, you know guys like Greg Gagne, even David San Martino, and some others. You have famous fathers, but uh, I mean, Greg Gagne was a, a real good wrestler. I mean, he's a, a good athlete, and uh, and. Uh, really would, did great stuff in the ring. I mean, great psychology, knows the business. He just had a tough time being Greg Gagne because he was never that big of a guy. And, uh, you know, when you say Vern Gagne and you're back in the 50s, you know, Vern was a big guy for being back in the 50s. You know, there's a big difference between, you know, Charles Atlas of 1950 and Arnold Schwarzenegger 
of 1970s or 80s. I mean, the, the, the difference is ridiculous, but we all know now that it's not real. But uh, Greg, Greg's problem in becoming really a big, big name was he just wasn't that big. He just looked kind of like a wiry, slender guy, which he was. And in wrestling, to get, you know, from being good to being great, there's got to be some kind of, again, back to that Sam Houston, an intimidating look. I mean, people were convinced, not that they might not be wrong, but you know, people were convinced because of the way I did interviews and because of the way I made my wrestling match correlate with my interviews, that I was the biggest ass in the world. I mean, people were convinced, even if they didn't believe wrestling, they were convinced Larry Zbysko was a real jerk, and they would, you know, go watch me because the motivation was there. They know something is really bad with this guy, you know. So there has to be an intimidating kind of thing, and Greg just was not an intimidating kind of guy. He was a great guy to watch fly around, but you know, people don't pay twenty nine ninety five to, you know, for that. Let's talk about the uh, the origins of Larry Lamb. Larry Land. Oh, God, that was a classic. Basically, the old AWA stuff, the ESPN days, the days when I got the AWA championship, you know, it kind of evolved. At the same time, I saw that goofy movie, uh, Vacation, where they went to Wally World. And it kind of dawned on me now that, uh, you know, the AWA has become, you know, my, my theme park. I mean, it was my championship. And, you know, from the pinnacle of ESPN and all this, I could throw challenges out to Hulk Hogan, and we, which I knew would never accept it because he can't wrestle. And I could throw challenges out to Ric Flair, which I knew wouldn't, wouldn't be accepted because he can't wrestle. So, you know, I could sit there and shoot my mouth off and be whatever I wanted because it was like my theme park. So I just uh, kind of stole a little bit from that movie where they went up to Wally World and punched the moose out and Disneyland and just kind of turned into Larry Land. Had a ring to it, and you know, the way I would put it with, uh, you know, the, the rides and that first class one way ticket to Larry Land, and made it sound like a place to go if you wanted to meet the legendary heavyweight champion of the world. It uh, it kind of fit in, and, and then uh, had a friend of mine in Detroit who actually wrestles a little bit once in a while. I've got some lad who used to wrestle as Killer Canaric. I think he still does, old Dano and did a lot with promoting rock bands. And this one rock band was going to name their album something, but they couldn't because of the copyright. So they called it Electric Larry Land after watching all my interviews. It was the Butthole Surfers. Okay. And they made an album called Electric Larry Land. I got one of them. With a pencil, some guy's bloody ear. But, but uh, So Larry Land will live forever in CD music history. You talked about uh, off camera again. It was uh, some politics that prevented uh, while you were the AWA champion uh, a match with the WCW champion. Oh, yeah, what an interesting little bit of historical politics at that time. Uh, you know, trying to compete again with uh, you know what the WWF was doing. I mean, the AWA, Vern Gagne, and, and the beginnings of WCW when I think Jim Hurd was running it and Sting was their champion. They wanted to promote you know something different, something that would be that would be re really good at the time, which was when I had the championship of the uh, AWA, they wanted me to come down, challenge, and wrestle Sting, who was the WCW champion. I guess it was probably WCW champion and not the NWA. But anyway, there was a kind of an old timer situated with the Turner group that, uh, you know, had the ear of, you know, who was running WCW at the time. I think it was Jim Hearn. I think mean, Hurd wanted to go for it. It would have been a real good idea, but there was this thinking of old school promoters of protecting your champion. I mean, your champion was basically your company. I mean, Hulk Hogan would represent the WWF, and Bachwinkle at the right time was like the, you know, or Vern was the AWA champion, and Fritz von Erich, you know, Flair was the NWA kind of, you know, champion. But the organizations, you know, that was like their, their golden calf. So they would always make sure their champions were protected to the best of their ability. And when they wanted Larry Zbysko, who was in the business a while and you know, had a reputation of you know, knowing how to wrestle, and they wanted him to wrestle Sting. And Sting was a nice kid, but it wasn't a wrestler. It was more of a bodybuilder guy that painted his face and took the name of a rock star singer guy. 
But uh, when one of the old timers of the WCW Turner promotion kind of told her that he didn't like the idea because Zabisco, who was the AWA champion, if he wanted to, could eat up and make Sting, the new WCW champion, look really bad. And uh, so that that kind of whitewashed that idea, and it, it never happened. And it's too bad because it would have been a, a real classic converta- you know, conf- a confrontation, and uh, it would have been great for Sting's career at the time. It would, it would have been really good. But uh, again, you, you you get in a conflict with the what should be done for the business, you know, uh, kind of ramming into the headstrong ideas of the remnants of old school thinking. But, you know, the times were changing then. It wasn't the territories anymore. There was really nothing to protect. It was just the business expanding and becoming nationwide. How about an old tag team partner of yours, uh, Arn Anderson? <coughs> Arn Anderson, double A. Arn's one of these guys you just can't help but love the guy. He's like a lovable oaf kind of guy, and uh, he's a great talent. I mean, I can't say nothing. I mean, I always liked Arn since the first day I saw him. He had that look. He had that movement. He's got that classic endomorphic body, and uh, I, I, I think Arn was uh, one of the best. I mean, probably could have been even promoted higher than he ever got. And we kind of wanted to almost being known as like a tag team guy, flair sidekick kind of guy. And uh, that's too bad. I think Iron could have been up there with anybody else that got up there. But uh, you know, men- mentally, I just, Iron just liked being what he, you know, where he was. He enjoyed that. He loved it. He loved the life. And uh, he was a, you know, great to tag team with. We had a lot of fun together. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a great time. It was, the laugh uh, indicated there was a story there that just popped. Well, there's ten thousand <laughs> Arn Anderson stories. You know, and, and things I haven't thought about in years, they all kind of like pop in there at one time. You know, where do I start to explain, well, you know, how much fun it was with Don? It was just one, you know, cartoon caper after another. And, and, and uh, the references used to have to, you know, to me, because I, I was a different style than R. I was a different style than most guys. And, and I had to be to survive and be different. I mean, I could get in the ring when they rang the bell and flop around with the best of them and being ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. And then, you know, it would be, so what? I, we just seen that in the last two matches. It, the bell rang and people started flopping around. So I developed a different kind of a psychological approach style of kind of a, almost a rope of dope, you know. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of the fans started terming, uh, putting a term to it called stalling. But to me, it wasn't stalling. To me, it was setting up a whole different atmosphere and a whole different look and a whole different character than... The other guys who were just out there flopping around. And Arn was more of the upbringing of, you know, when they rang the bell, you flopped around. So uh, <laughs> he used to call me Granite Man, because I used to come there and like stand there. You know, and then the guys wouldn't attack me anyway, because I'd just stretch them. So I'd stand as long as I want, you know. And, but I did it in a way that built the crowd up. And then when something did happen, the crowd went nuts. And, uh, you know, some of the guys just couldn't fathom that. So I remember one time we were wrestling out somewhere outside of Las Vegas in an army base outside. And there's a whole bunch of people all dressed in camouflage like shrubbery. And me and Arn are wrestling, and, and it's windy as hell like a sandstorm. It's like standing in the ring getting sandblasted in the middle of, like, this army base, which you didn't see too much. Most of it was, like, the underground secret thing. And I remember I went out there, and every time the people start chanting, Larry sucked. I'd prolong it, you know, I'd start what people would call stalling, but I would just prolong it because it was more exciting than flopping around. So as soon as I walked out there in the, in the ring and the sand is just killing us in the eyes, I, I stepped out to wrestle and, and the crowd started chanting, Larry sucks. As soon as Arn heard that, he started cussing at me, no, damn it, not tonight, no, damn it, no, take it, God damn, no, oh no, I can't take it tonight. Because he knows I'm going to stand there for you know, 10, 12 minutes. He's going to get sandblasted. Oh, he was going, hey, I'll kill you. Oh, God, I used to drive him nuts. It was, yeah, he's a classic. Uh, any memories of uh, your feud with Stephen Regal? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I didn't do a whole bunch back in them days because I was really getting into the, the golf mode, you know, and I just got tired of you know, having a couple of arthroscopic surgeries on this knee, one on this knee, one on the elbow, teeth put back in. You know, I, I just got to the point where 
Yeah, I just don't want to be out there like bouncing around, you know, like Arn Anderson who's like, he has got some nerve damage now. And you wind up, you know, like, you know, 40 years old wrestling a bunch of guys who want to, you know, make something of themselves. But I just didn't want it to be at my expense. And it wasn't worth it financially for me to just keep wrestling, you know, like, like nobody, newcomer guys. So, yeah, I, I really love the broadcasting. And, 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 and in comes Regal. And again, it, it, it's, it's too bad, like, you know, people in, in charge and the way the politics were, you know, can't see the forest through the trees or sometimes just refuse to. It's almost like sometimes they just pout and say, I don't want to make money. I just want to do it my way. But, um, you know, Rigo is one of these guys that people just love to hate. I mean, Rigo could almost do what I did. He could just walk out of that ring and stand there and the place would go nuts. You know, and I recognize this and I, uh, at, at that time, too, the, the ratings in TBS were going down, and I wanted to prove a point to some people. So uh, me and Regal had a, a, a confrontation, and it uh, you know, kind of went along in some steps. But, uh, you know, again, it was one of the things where people just had to see, and it was a classic. And, and Regal was great, and, of course, I'm a legend, and uh, we wrestled on TBS Saturday night, and it was the toughest day. It was like May 20-something, right before summer, Memorial Day or Labor Day. Whatever holiday that is, but at the beginning of the summer, and that's a very bad, notoriously bad day for ratings because no one's home. They're all driving, visiting, grilling out, swimming, drowning, whatever. So, um, so me and Rigo wrestled that day, and the rating went from like a 1.7 the week before to like almost a three, which was like more than double on the hardest day. But you know, if people and I told him, I says, I'm telling, I'm giving you proof. If people want to see something. They're going to see it because they were making all kinds of excuses of why their business is so bad. It's not like, well, we got to like promote new guys. You know, they're thinking as well, let's promote the same guys we've had the last 15 years. I mean, if I see Sting and Luger and Flair and Lex, and, you know, anymore, I want to kill myself. And that's what the audience was doing. You know, I mean, you know, these people just didn't realize that, you know, you want to see someone wrestle someone else after a while. You know, and so I kind of tried to prove it with Regal. He was the perfect guy. And of course, after I proved it, and all of them got fired, and there was a new boss in there. So, Before we get into those days, uh, backtracking a little bit, the Western States Heritage title, I think you retired that title. Do you have any memories of your feud with Barry Windham? You know, yeah, well, I, I have a few. I, mean, I remember it was a Long Island Coliseum baby doll that was involved. You want to know what I remember most about that match? I got these new pair of tights, and they were cut funny or wrong or bad. They, they weren't made right, but I was stuck. It's the only pair of tights I had on me that day. And when I put it on, I was horrified because it wasn't big enough and my ass was hanging out. <laughs> and I remember walking into the Long Island Coliseum thinking, my God, my ass is sticking out. And I never forget that stupid feeling. And everybody thought it was such a you know, classical match and thing. I really never looked at it as that big of a deal, the Western States. I mean, it, I mean, it was a good, you know, good match and Barry was good. And, and blah, blah, but uh, for some reason, people like that Western States heritage. Does that have a classy sounding name or something? Yeah. But uh, a lot of people ask me about that, and, and that's really one of the things I've done that I don't really consider to be really that much of anything. Right, and uh, I know you have a lot of feelings on the subject. We'll just, I'll just throw it out there and let you go wherever you want with it. But how about the, the uh, demise of WC? The demise of, how much time we got? <laughs> Well, you know, as we put it towards the end, just in case. You know, the whole saga of WCW is, uh, is, is really, it's just like the rise and the fall. It's the agony and the ecstasy. It's uh, it war and peace. I mean, it, 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 it's a classic. Uh, it, you know, a Ted Turner, I guess that all goes back to, you know, Ted, Ted Turner, when he was Channel 17 years ago, a little... Uh, double wide trailer and some hill on UHF, you know, had live wrestling every Saturday. To make a long story short, because we'll run out of time with this one. To make a long story short, uh, you know, you know, wrestling was one of the things that enabled his TV company to survive. The ratings were there. We used to do wrestling matches at the old uh, baseball stadium to draw people in to watch the Braves, because the Braves would have two people sitting out there. And uh, Ted Turner, you know, not only loved wrestling and is a big wrestling fan, but also as a businessman realized, 
people love to watch the show. This is the show giving me the ratings. This is the show letting me survive, you know, and build up this TV out of, you know, UHF nothing. And, and it did, and he was grateful, and that's why wrestling was always on TBS for 30 years on prime time, Saturday night at 6 o'clock, Saturday morning, Sunday night. For 30 years it was on there. It was part of cable television tradition. And uh, it was some classic things going on there. You know, and then as time went by, you know, it got bigger, it got bigger, but it got bigger because Ted Turner wanted to get bigger. And uh, when WCW, you know, or the NWA was engulfed by this, or the Crockett's went bankrupt or whatever, but Turner wound up buying it, there was always some static from the North Tower. I mean, like, the big shots on your Turner's board or whatever. You know, Ted say, I love wrestling, and then everybody would say, okay, Ted, but then half of them would go, my God, wrestling, oh my God, we hate wrestling. But Ted wants wrestling, you know, but still wrestling would... It must have irritated them or something because no matter how much some of these big power guys didn't like wrestling, wrestling was their number one show. And when Turner, you know, decided that Nitro, you know, he wanted more on, uh, you know, it opened up the doors for uh, mega money to be spent on production. And uh, it, it got real big. I mean, it brought in like $200 million one year. Plus, not only that, it, it provided hours and hours and hours of programming, which, which would have cost millions of dollars to produce or buy. I mean, it was a gold mine. TNT, TBS was number one cable station, you know, in, in the country. And uh, it was professional wrestling that, uh, that did it. Uh, then, you know, guys got in power. Some guys didn't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to, to, to get into everything. It, it's such a complex mishmash of professional wrestling trying to merge with a giant corporation, you know, professional wrestlers who are basically insane, trying to deal with a bunch of skinny, really uh, probably anal individuals who wear suits every day and have their shoes shine. I mean, the complete opposite end of the spectrum. They didn't understand what kind of show they had. And uh, as wrestling got gigantic and the money got gigantic, it, it got so big so fast that basically the people running it lost control. And too much control was given to people who didn't know. And pretty soon the inmates were running the asylum. You know, instead of the, the, the boss saying, uh, you and you have to wrestle and be here, the guys would say, well, in my contract, it says, I only have to wrestle uh, 65 days a year, and last night was 65 days. I mean, the company was so big, the legal people didn't even realize these guys have wrestled X amount of days. I mean, who would, who would think? You wouldn't think you've wrestled X amount of days. We've got to kiss your butt. You've got to think, hey, you're our top guy. You've got to be there for the show, for the business, for the company, with the responsibility of putting food on the guy's table who are working underneath you and, and, and all that. I mean, the whole concept and respect for the business was kind of lost in, in a corporation that tried to be good, but tried to mix complete legal corporate structure with the uncontrollable, chaotic energy of professional wrestling. I mean, you're, the two worlds just had a hard time gelling. And to make a longer story short, then came along the corporate buyouts. And Turner was a great company. And I can't say enough nice things about Ted and his company, but when Time Warner bought it over, now we're getting barraged with not only people who don't know the business, but now the control's going to people who don't like the business for some reason, where Ted Turner liked it and he could say something that would matter. Now we've got people in there that, that are saying, well, uh, my wife wants to see the dog show, but professional wrestling's number one. But, but why? I mean, they just didn't understand that the, the reason it was number one is because 45 million people want to watch it. I mean, I, I, I still can't figure it out. I still don't know, don't know why it's not on network. But along comes the, the corporate buyouts, uh, a combination of uh, the wrestlers themselves, guys who came in uh, 
you know, a couple of years earlier, got some real nice contracts, and we're very thankful individuals. And, and after, it's amazing, after about a year or so, these thankful individuals became very cocky, got big heads, believed they knew what they were doing. The people who were running it were stupid enough to put clauses in their contracts that said, well, then they have the right not to do this and not to go there and only work so many days. And, uh, you know, the brain power would, would say, well, these guys have a big contract, so they must know what they're doing. Instead of realizing that, hey, the guy before me was fired because he gave this idiot a big contract. It was the most uh, kind of absurd, lost in the shuffle of bigness, you know, thing I've ever saw, you know, com combined with the fact that a bunch of guys who should be very grateful got very big heads and became prima donnas. And it was a very uh, deadly combination. And uh, the company, uh, you know, in, in a last ditch effort, for some strange reason, thought they figured out how Vince McMahon did it. They were told after Eric got uh, removed the second and the final time that uh, Vince McMahon's secret weapons was the writers. In fact, I had a, a long talk with Mr. Bush at the time, and I. And uh, after he did something before even talking to a lot of people, he did it so fast, I couldn't believe it, but they, they thought they did a good thing by stealing a couple of McMahon's writers. And I remember saying to them, well, why did you do that? These guys haven't been around. They don't know. And the reply was, well, we think they're Vince McMahon's secret weapon. And you want to know the funny part, Larry? They weren't under contract. We we, we could sneak them away. Like they thought they were pulling the wool out of Vince's eyes in his last dish effort. And I says, guys, the reason Vince McMahon doesn't have them under contract is because Vince don't need them. I said, McMahon is McMahon's secret weapon. He's been there for 30 years and knows the business. He don't let these writers run it. He takes an idea. He might use it. He might change it. Or he might throw it out. But you don't see the writer running around. You don't see the world championship belt on his rider, but it's on our rider. I mean, is something wrong with this picture here? And next thing I knew, that guy was gone. He ran for the hill. I mean, it was just a combination of, you know, 10 years with 10 different bosses, uh, a heck of a company that tried but just listened to the wrong people and got led down the wrong roads, believe in the wrong things, and... Um, it's it's just it's just too bad. It was a lot of people that spent a lot of years and made wrestling so big it was ridiculous. The only good part is, like any other good thing in life, you know, it goes up and down. And right now the fans are sitting back going, God, was it exciting when WCW and then the WWF and then there was this fight for the ratings. And, I mean, the clash between the two every Monday night was one of the things that made it exciting. Now all that excitement's gone. So the wrestling business will survive. It's going to find another way. And someone else is going to pop up somewhere sooner or later. Or uh, some national uh, cable network. Or, In fact, whoever buys this tape can mark my words. I don't know what date it is. Sooner or later. I mean, they can't think of any more dumb lawyer shows, bloody hospital dramas, detective shows. Sooner or later... Wrestling's going to be on network. NBC or CBS or ABC, someone's going to pick it up. I mean, no matter what, what it's on, whether it's on UHF, whether it's on cable, whether it's on network, it's going to be number one if you run it right. So sooner or later, it's going to get just as exciting as it was a few years ago, but even bigger. Then there'll be 3D dimensional holographic video games where wrestlers are life size and 3D in your living room flying through your chandelier laser light, who knows, I mean, but, uh, you know, if, if I were to look back th 30 years ago to what I started with, to where it is today, me sitting in front of some little camera talking, I never would have believed it, so. Another four or five years, knowledge of the world doubles every 22 months. So two years from now, we'll probably have the first battle royal ever off the moon. <laughs> How good did it feel in the prime of uh, Nitro <coughs> to, to have the Larry Chance you weren't even oh. entering town at the time. <clears throat> the Larry Chants were classic. I, I, I thank you all who did that. 
but it was a it was a great feeling because uh, you know I mean in my broadcasting and in, in, the, in the situations I did with the, the the New World Order and Scott Hall and Eric Bischoff which the people wanted to see I mean we blew them away and the buy rates were big and the ratings were big the people chanted Nitro Girls were great but the people chanted I mean when I walked out and uh, and did it the people chanted you know I kind of like gave them all the big L and for some reason it, it stuck and it got to become a tradition of nitro. I mean, that was the thing. We'd go out, they'd put the lights on, they'd chant Larry, I'd get up, and then as soon as i sit down, then they'd all start chanting Goldberg, and I mean, the building would rock, and the place was exciting. In fact, they chanted Larry so much that it ticked off the upper echelon, and they actually got like, not mad at me, but they were trying to convince me not to get up and acknowledge the crowd. You know, and again, I would say, why, when you have, you know, 20,000 people in the building obviously enjoy something and want to do it, why is your first instinct to take it away from them? You know, and at that time, it was probably jealousy. I could hear some of the guys, you know, in the back crabbing, making comments like, well, God, the, the, the biggest hero in the place is the, is the broadcaster, he's the best guy. You know, it's not me. I mean, it's amazing how some of these guys are crybabies. But... Uh, Anyway, I put my foot down and basically told them that, look, as long as the people chant Larry, I'm standing up and giving them the big L. If you don't like it, give me my release, and I'll, uh, I'll talk to Jim Ross if it's been mad. Thank you very much. So they just kind of got off my back. But then about six months down the road, they changed shows, and I was off Nitro, which that didn't work because they chanted Larry on Thunder. And then when Russo came in, I said, uh, looks like it's time for the senior tour. This place is going down the tubes. So um, I was right again, unfortunately. And speaking of the senior tour, you want know, to tell everybody about your uh, your plans with with uh, golf? Well, you know, I was years ago when I was young. I was torn between two worlds. I was grew up on the golf course, you know, like uh, you know, suburban lifestyle back then. And I, I used to like golf. Me and my buddies would play golf all the time. And then I used to love to wrestle. Then when I got a little older and you know went to the wrestling you know frame of mind. I didn't golf that much, even though I knew the dynamics of the game and stuff. But went into wrestling and, and then just played a lot of golf as time went on. The last 10 years, when I did the broadcast job, I really had lots of time, more time than I ever had. I'd work sometimes two hours a week. You know, sometimes I was doing a bunch of shows, and even though if I do like four shows, I'd, I'd run down and do them like all in one day because the shows would be done. I would just voice them over. And if I did nitro sometime, i take the clubs with me, golf all day, go there at night, do the nitro, go out to the casino with a couple of the nitro chicks. I mean, life was good. Yeah, AC jazz, a little drunk. So uh, it was a great time. But, uh, you know, but now when I start getting older and I'm doing the broadcasting and I have my knees sculpted and the elbows sculpted, and I'm watching wrestling chains and I'm going, God, I never, I never thought of falling through a table full of barbed wire when I wrestled in Shea Stadium. I must have missed something. So I decided, uh, you know, I'm not getting any younger, so we just kept playing more golf, and then, you know, I had the time where I could golf three, four times a week, you know, and I did that for about 10 years. Played one celebrity pro tournament about four or five years ago, and they kind of called me at the last minute. But it was a big thrill. I didn't do bad, I came in like 21st out of 40 guys with really no preparation, or, you know, kind of nervous. But it was, it was a thrill, and I played some, uh, uh, senior uh, mini tours, professional mini tours, uh, you know, this summer and uh, did pretty good. I was very proud of myself and uh, I'm talking to some, uh, actually a couple of people, but actually down to one individual now about sponsoring me on the uh, senior tour, doing the Q School in November and uh, giving the senior tour a shot. And the Q School is, you know, it's not guaranteed. It's kind of you know breaks. It's it, it's it's tough to get through. If your putts go in, you win. If not, you know. But then they got the Monday qualifier. So you know, for the next year, I'm kind of planning on, on doing lots of golf and seeing if I can get on the uh, the senior tour. Because that way, instead of getting beat up, I'll just ride around in a cart looking good. People chant Larry. I'll give them all the big L. The big shots won't yell at me for it, and we'll just golf happy ever after. It sounds it sounds like a good plan. It's a good plan. You know, we'll see. If I if I don't get on, I'll be uh, probably falling through tables with flaming barbed wire. What's up, Matt? Got to do something. Okay, about ra about wrapping up this uh, this interview. Do you have any closing comments? Any 
things that we haven't touched on that you want to make sure you get in here? Well, we touched on quite a bit. I mean, I could go on for, I, mean, I could be back over two, three days, you know, with stories and the things that pop in my mind, but, uh, God, the, the only thing, uh, the only thing I can say is, God, it was a, it was a, it was a great 30 years in professional wrestling. If I had my life to do again, I would have been a golfer, but I didn't, and I don't, so, uh. You know, I, I really can't. Uh, I really can't even say how much f I've enjoyed being a wrestler. How much, I, even when the fans hated me and loved me, how great it was. Because uh, there's some things I could never tell the fans. If I told the fans that, uh, it, it would it would kill the you know, all the fun for them. But uh, but you never know. Larry Zabisco may be golfing, or Larry Zabisco may not be done yet. There's a couple of things in the works, and we won't talk about it right now. We'll just. Uh, We'll just say, keep your eye open. In professional wrestling, you never know. Don't give up. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Don't give up. Fight forever. Fight forever and ever and ever and ever!